Titus was a younger man than Paul, although I suspect that Paul called almost anybody in the church his son in one way, but he is a son in a sense of Paul, and Paul had a great deal of affection for Titus. He doesn't seem to have been quite in the same category of Paul's affection as Timothy because there was a special bond there that was just unmatched with any other living human being. But Titus really was around a lot earlier than Timothy. You recall him being mentioned at the Jerusalem conference that Titus took, I mean, Paul took Titus with him down to the Jerusalem conference. Uh, he, it was, as a Gentile, this was a very important decision. He was obviously a leader. He was obviously a dominant factor in the church very early. So by the time Paul gets around to writing this epistle to Titus, he's writing to an experienced minister, a man who obviously has been used in several, on several occasions to deal with difficult situations. And this situation in Crete, where Titus was at this point in time, was really one of the more serious that he had been entrusted with. It was a, a difficult time there. The churches were in somewhat of disarray. There was considerable immorality to be dealt with. It was, according to Paul, growing out of the natural proclivities of the people of Crete in some way. Titus had been left there to solve these problems, and Paul had gone on his way. This letter is written sometime after Paul's first imprisonment, and probably before the Nero persecution began in about 64 A.D. So you're talking in the early 60s, and somewhere in generally about the same time that the letters to Timothy, that the first letter to Timothy was written. So Titus, one of the later letters of Paul, a pastoral epistle, because it is directed to him with general pastoral instructions. The letter is interesting in the way it begins, because it is not simply a personal letter given to Titus. Listen, and you'll hear what I'm talking about. Paul, a servant of God, and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before the world began, but has in due times manifested his word, manifested his word through preaching, which is committed to me according to the commandment of God our Savior. To Titus, my own son in the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. Now, that's a rather long introduction for such a short book. It's very formal, not personal, as one would expect a letter from Paul to a very close, long-time trusted co-worker, right? And his statements in the opening, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, he didn't have to tell Titus that. You see, this letter was sent to Titus for him to read before these local churches. It was a matter of establishing Titus's authority before these people. It was a matter of confirming what he was telling them, that this is coming from Paul himself, not merely from me, my brethren. I want you to understand that. Now listen, as we study the basic message of the epistle that he gave to Titus. Verse 5, For this cause I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking. There were some things that had not been done. The churches were in some disarray, and things needed to be set in order. He said, I want you to set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I have appointed you. He wanted people established there. He wanted to leave those churches with leadership. And there's every indication that there weren't elders everywhere and that the churches were in some degree of disarray because of it. Now he enters into the qualifications of these men who are going to be ordained as elders, ministers, leaders in those churches. And these vary slightly from the ones in Timothy, and some of the variations are rather interesting. He said, if any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. Notice the term faithful children. Now, in Timothy, when he speaks of these things, it's, it's given from the perspective that the minister is supposed to rule well his own house, that he's supposed to hold his children in subjection with all gravity. In other words, it deals with what he is doing relative to his children. This one deals really with the qualifications of the children. The word faithful, the commentaries tell us, should be understood as believing children because the word pistos comes from the same root as pistis, faith, and it has to do with being in the faith or being faithful. Uh, you could tra- translate it in certain contexts as, context as loyal, but it is seen here as faithful in the sense of believing. Now, I think that's rather interesting because 
In the first place, it tells us that there's a, a question mark as to whether children will believe or whether they will not. And we're dealing with a man here who, if he has not been successful in teaching his own children about Jesus Christ, about God, about the Bible, if his own children do not believe the faith, then he is really not qualified to serve as a bishop or an overseer in the church of God. His children cannot be accused of riot. They cannot be unruly. They need to be children of the faith. Naturally, they must be old enough to be classified as believers or unbelievers. Four, five, six, and seven-year-olds are not going to be really classified that way one way or the other. But older children certainly can be. And they are supposed to be faithful or believing children of the men that he's going to be ordaining as ministers in the church. He says a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God. Now, this is important. A steward is a person who is placed over, made responsible for the goods of another person. The church, then, is seen as belonging to God. The minister does not own the church. It is not his church. They are not his people. The flock don't belong to him. These are God's people, and he is a steward of them. And then comes the next qualification, not self-willed. That's not a person who is just absolutely bound and determined to have his own way no matter what. Not the sort of person that if he's in the wrong and he's challenged on it, that he will defend his wrong position just simply because it's his position. Self-willed is not a good trait for a minister. Not soon angry. He should not be a hot-tempered person who flies off the handle whenever people challenge him because ministers are going to be challenged. And they've got to understand that you don't lash out at people verbally or physically. That should go without saying, but Paul includes it here. He is not soon angry, not given to wine, and not a striker. Now, I can't emphasize too much this qualification of not being given to wine. A minister cannot be an alcoholic. He cannot even be close to being an alcoholic. Being a minister is a very sober and a very resp very serious responsibility. One of the worst things in the world that could happen is for a man to engage in some ministerial activity with his judgment impaired by alcohol. It's a devastating thing to have happen. Ministers have, on occasion, gone into the pulpit having had some what to drink. Be it little or much, it's wrong. The priests were absolutely expressly forbidden to enter the temple and to serve having had anything to drink. They were not allowed to do so. They could drink elsewhere at another time, but not when they were serving in a temple. You know, I guess in a way, it's, it's sort of like the rule that they have for pilots, that you've got to have a certain length of time from the bottle to the throttle. You just cannot drink and fly. Well, I think that a minister's responsibility is just as great as that of a pilot of an airplane or an airline pilot. And in fact, the responsibility can be even heavier in some ways. Not only is there the possibility of destroying people's lives, there is the possibility of affecting their eternal lives as well. Well, what if he's a, a recovering alcoholic? Well, I would say a minister would have to be long recovered for several reasons. One is alcohol for an alcoholic is an awfully powerful temptation. And it's something which all alcoholics who are knowledgeable about what's wrong with them. No. How easy it is to fall back into it. They understand that it's a progressive disease, that it stays with them for the rest of their lives. An alcoholic is going to have to go the extra mile, way above and beyond what he would otherwise have to do, to prove himself before he could ever serve in a ministerial capacity. One reason, as I say, is because of the great danger of a relapse. The second reason is because of the enormous damage that he has done, both to his character and to his reputation. And until that has been rebuilt, he can't serve because people will bring the church into reproach for putting a man who has a known drinking problem into, into, into positions of responsibility. An alcoholic can recover, and they can be in God's kingdom, but they have a special obligation if they're ever going to serve in a ministerial capacity, and it is not going to be easy to get there. He cannot be given to wine. He cannot be a striker. He cannot be given to filthy lucre. That just means he's not greedy. He's not a person who's going to give his attention and everything about his life and just bound up in the making of money. Now, if that's what he's doing, if that's what he wants in life, then let him go do it. But it will distort 
twist and pervert the ministry. Do we need to explain that? He needs to be a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men. You know, he really enjoys the company of good men. There are people who don't, you know. Good men, for a person who is given to wine, can be an absolute crashing bore. Right? I mean, you don't want some sober-sided goody-two-shoes sitting around when you and your friends are getting drunk and telling dirty jokes, do you? When you're in that kind of a mood, a, a good man is not somebody you want to have around. So a minister, though, must be a person who enjoys, relishes, embraces the company of good men. He doesn't find them to be bores. The difference is important. He is to be sober. He is to be just. That is fair and fair-minded. And the kind of a person who will give in on having his own way in order to be just and to be fair. He is to be holy. That means belonging to God. He is to be temperate. He's not a glutton, doesn't drink too much, doesn't eat too much, doesn't do anything too much. Holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught. Now there is one of the great criteria for a man who's going to be in the ministry. He is going to have to be a person who has an enormous amount of respect for what he has been taught. Oh, it's fine to go out blazing new trails and finding new truths and charging off up and down the roads and the byways of, of, of new ideas and concepts. But it says that a minister, a bishop, a pastor of a local church needs to be a person who holds fast the faithful word as he has been taught. Why? That he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convict the gainsayers. Now, gainsayers are always with us, as Paul puts it, for there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers. And in his time, it was especially those of the circumcision. Those people, those Jews, who came in and around the church, who associated with the church, who had dealings with the churches in these areas, were a pain to the ministry because they were quite knowledgeable of the Bible as far as Old Testament was concerned. But they just had a perverted view of the gospel. And the better you know the Bible when you're perverted in your view of it, the more trouble you can cause for people who are trying to do right by God. Well, he said there were plenty of them around. They weren't just of the circumcision. They just happened to be dominant at that time. And there will always be this. You just write this down in your little book of remembrances. There will always be unruly and vain talkers and deceivers around the church. Always. What do you do about it then? Well, he says their mouths have got to be stopped. They subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not, and a lot of times they're doing it for money's sake. Filthy lucre, although not always, I might add. Sometimes it's for power. But, of course, even doing it for money is doing it for power. How, then, do you stop their mouths? Well, it's by the faithful men of the church holding fast the faithful word as they have been taught, and convicting the gainsayers by sound doctrine and exhortation. That's how it's done. It is not done by grabbing them bodily and throwing them out in the street. It's not done by scaring the church half out of their wits about the lake of fire if they talk to any of these men. You address the doctrines. You come face to face and come to grips with their ideas and their concepts and their perverted concepts, and you teach the word and preach the word and be faithful in the in season and out of season. You stick to the book and be ready and prepared to convict them if you expect to be effective in stopping their mouths. Because, you see, when you throw them out of the church, you are seen as a great persecutor. And they're the underdog. And their mouths aren't stopped. They're just going to flap those mouths and flap those mouths and flap those mouths. So, you know, it pays you to do your homework, to know your Bible, to be able to explain, to exhort, to teach, especially the little ones who are upset and disturbed by these folks. You may never really succeed in stopping their mouth, but your only chance lies in sound doctrine and teaching of the Word. He goes on to talk about these fellows. He said, one of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies. This witness is true. <laughs> 
He didn't have a lot of respect for people of Crete and the island of Crete. That, you know, he's not talking about all of them. Basically, he's talking about the worst side of those people, and particularly of the unruly and vain talkers who were causing all the trouble in the local congregations in Crete. And he said it was a Cretan prophet who said the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies, that which I presume means lazy. This witness is true, Paul said. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Under the pure all things are pure, but unto them who are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. Even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and to every good work reprobate. Oh, what a condemnation. You know, you ought to take a good look at yourself in the light of that verse. Do you know God? Well, you say you do. You know, I, I know God. I think I do. Don't we all know God? Well, he said, they, these people professed that they knew God. But in their works, in the things that they did, in the way that they lived their lives, they denied him. How do you deny God? Well, you do it by ignoring his word. You know, God says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Holy. You know what that word means? It means keep the Sabbath day as belonging to God. It's holy. It belongs to him. It doesn't belong to you. Six days belong to you. One day belongs to God, just as 9% of what God gives into your hand belongs to you, and one and 10, I'm sorry, 90% of it belongs to you, and 10% of it belongs to God. It's holy. It says right here that you've got to look at what is holy. In, good, in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and to every good work reprobate, reprobate. If you're going to love God, and God says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, what are you going to do on the Sabbath day? You know, I didn't say, what are you not going to do? I said, what are you going to do to keep it holy? A lot of people ask questions. Well, should I do this on the Sabbath day? Should I, I do that on the Sabbath day? And I might reply to you, say, well, I don't know what you should do. All I know is that this, the commandment says, remember the Sabbath day. Don't forget it. Don't let it slip from your mind. And keep it holy. It belongs to God. Is this something you ought to be doing on a day that belongs to God? Well, now you say you know God, but sometimes in works, do you deny him being disobedient? Well, we hope that your disobedience is not so abominable that God will stop listening to you altogether. These people were. And every good work, didn't make any difference what the good work was, these people were reprobate in it. But speak the things that become sound doctrine. Teach the aged men that they be sober and grave and temperate sound in faith, in charity, and in patience. Teach the aged women likewise that they be in behavior as becomes holiness, not false accusers. You well, you know how easy it is to accuse people falsely, to, to arrive at conclusions, to impute motives, to decide, well, this person can't be righteous, and they can't be right with God, and they can't, they can't be in God's church, or they can't be in God's kingdom because of this. Well, you don't know. You don't know their heart. You don't know what's going on inside their heads and their minds. You don't know what kind of things that they have been through. You don't know what they said to God in their prayers this morning. But when you arrive at motives of people and discuss them with other people, you become a false accuser. That aged women are not to be given to much wine. That's interesting, isn't it? This is not some great office in the church. He's just talking to the older men, the older women, and he's dealing with, I guess, some of the problems maybe that they had at that time. But you know, there are an awful lot of women nowadays who, because of being alone so much, actually do get given to wine. Alcoholism among women who stay at home a lot is a serious problem in this country. The aged women are not to be given too much wine. They are actually to be teachers of good things. And you've got to lay this alongside Paul's other statement, I suffer not a woman to teach. But you see, the other statement says, I'd suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man. So in this situation, they are to be teachers of good things that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. Now, the young women need to be taught to love their children. No, I don't think when you get down to the elementary aspects of love, you know, of affection, of holding and kissing and touching, they, they, I wouldn't think so. There is a natural love of, of the mother for the ch child that, that doesn't have to be taught. And yet, he says, let the older women teach the younger women to love their children. 
which means there is a level of loving of children that does need to be taught. Now, that is a prerogative and a responsibility of mature and experienced women in the church. And they also need to teach their younger women to be to love their husbands. Once again, there is a level of loving of the husband that needs to be taught. And it can be learned, and it necessarily isn't just natural to you. They, they are need to be taught to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. You come across this expression, that the word of God be not blasphemed. And what Paul basically means by that is that we who are the church and we who are God's people who hold the word of God and who are proclaiming the word of God, if our lives are corrupt, we cause the word of God to be blasphemed by people out of the church who look at us and say, if that's religion, I don't want any part of it. In other words, every person in the church, the bishop, the deacon, the old men, the old women, the young women, and the young men are to be examples to the world and to one another. Listen, teach the young men likewise, verse 6. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded, and then to himself, to Titus, he says, in all things showing yourself a pattern of good works. You know, that is a heavy, heavy responsibility that descends upon a minister's shoulders. You know, just if you're false acu- falsely accused of something by somebody, that's an unfortunate thing. What do you do when you're falsely accused? Do you just rub it in somebody's face? No. You can't necessarily, denying it may not help. But the one thing you've got to realize is that what you do and how you respond to criticism needs to be in the pattern of good works. Not in a pattern of rebellion or hostility or name-calling or getting even. When you are criticized, when you are unfairly judged, you must respond in a pattern of good works. In doctrine, you need to show that you are not corrupted, that you are sound. You need to be grave, that is serious, about doctrine. You need to be sincere about doctrine. There's no point in pretending to hold the doctrines of the church when you do not. There's no, there's nothing to be gained by seeming to agree with the brethren when you're really in total disagreement on important points of doctrine in the church. Your doctrinal approach should not be corrupt. It should be sincere, and it should be from the heart. And if it's not, you don't belong in the ministry. He goes on to say, show this pattern of good works, which includes sound speech that cannot be condemned. That he that is of the contrary part, he's going to be around. You can count on that. You can bank on it. That he is of the contrary part is going to be ashamed having no evil thing to say about you. You know, I don't think I'll ever get there. But I am commanded to try. Like Titus, I've got to try to make my life a pattern of good works. Just a little pattern that, that if somebody is using me as a role model, he will not go astray. Now, fortunately, unfortunately, I, I will never be able to be a perfect pattern. But that in no way relieves me of the responsibility for doing as well as I can in being a pattern of good works. Now, you are also to exhort servants to be obedient to their own masters and to please them well in all things, not gainsaying or talking back, not stealing. That's a big deal with slaves, I'm afraid, in the old times and probably in later times. Not purloining, but showing all good fidelity, faithfulness in all things that are put in your hands, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. What an interesting expression. That the pattern of life of old men, old women, young women, young men, and of the ministry is supposed to accomplish a kind of adorning of the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. You know, you look at certain people, certain religious communities in our world today, and you know you find sometimes much to admire in them. You may find, for example, a pattern of family life, which is really admirable, where families do get together and where families are encouraged to spend time together in the study of God's Word and where they do so. And you find where in those communities people try to live a clean life. You know, they may have their self-righteousness and their other problems, but a clean living, 
healthy families, uh, close families. These things adorn and decorate the doctrines of that church. And one of the things we're supposed to do is to have people look at the pattern of our lives and of our whole church and say, those are good people. And I don't necessarily agree with their doctrine, but they have got something in that religion that is good and that produces good in these people in their lives, their style, and their family. That is expected of us as Christians. This book, this little letter to Titus, is about that. It is about the lifestyle of Christians in the church and how it adorns, decorates, advances the gospel. How critical that is. So he goes on then, having made that point, having said that we will adorn the, God, the, the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify to himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Don't let anybody put you down, which is exactly what that let no man despise you means. Don't let anyone put you down. You teach these things. You speak them boldly. You exhort, and if necessary, you rebuke people who are out of line on these patterns of good works and these, these, this adorning of the gospel of God. Live a clean life. Be a moral person because it's important to the success of the work of God. Continuing in the same line, Paul gives an, another exhortation, which I've always found to be very interesting. Uh, having exhorted everybody to be really good and live a clean and a moral and an upright life because of what it will mean to the church and, and the reputation of the church and the effectiveness of the church in doing its work in the world, there is a problem of self-righteousness. Self-righteousness is probably the most difficult sin to see in yourself because uh, if you think you're right, uh, self-righteousness is wrong. And, and you, if you admit to self-righteousness, then you're admitting you're wrong and everything goes down the drain. You, you see what I mean? It's kind of a around in a circle thing. How do you go about convincing someone that they are self-righteous? Well, Paul tries it this way. He says, put these people in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, that would just be subject to the civil government. It's a theme he developed also in Romans. To be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man. Now there is a pretty tough commandment. To look around you in the world and to see some of the evil and the rottenness, the corruption, the, the frustrating behavior of other people, it's awfully difficult not to let your mouth fly open and to begin to badmouth, revile, uh, actually tear down the character of another human being. He says, I want you to put these people in mind that they speak evil of no man. Not that they're supposed to not speak evil of good people or moderate people. They're not even supposed to speak evil of bad men. Why is that? Well, let's continue. He says, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers. You're not supposed to be a fighting type, or arguing, bickering type person. But gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. Now, you see, meekness in a person is very much the op opposite of speaking evil of someone because the instant you open your mouth to speak evil of another person, to put down another person, to badmouth another person, you have set yourself above that person. Oh, yeah. Don't deny it. There's no other way. If you're going to speak evil of another man, you, the, the presumption is there that you are better than he is. But if you are showing meekness unto all men, if you're acknowledging that you're not better than they are, then what business would you have of speaking evil of them? Now, why, why should you do this? Why should you speak evil of no man? And why should you show all meekness to all men? Well, because we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Oh, this doesn't describe you, do it. You've, 
you've never been foolish, have you? So that's not that doesn't apply to you. You've never been disobedient, have you? Uh, that couldn't couldn't apply to you. Was there ever a time when you were deceived? Uh, surely not. Because if you're speaking evil of another man, you're assuming that, that he knows better. You're not even granting him the luxury of being deceived in many cases. But you see, you have been deceived. Was there ever a time when you served various lusts and pleasures? You know, ever a time when you indulged yourself in malice and envy toward other people? There was never a time, surely, when you were hateful towards somebody. Oh, yes, there was. You know, you see, the, the truth is that when you speak of evil of another person, you condemn yourself because you're not really any better than he is. Maybe if you are different now, is it because of your goodness, because of your accomplishments? Paul says, you know, you were this way. We ourselves were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures. We ourselves lived in malice. We lived in envy. We were hateful. What changed all that? But after the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration, by the renewing of the Holy Spirit, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. You know, it's sobering when you think about it. I remember one day I was driving down a road. That time I, I was working on a garbage truck for Ambassador College. I was carrying away all the trash. That was my job. I was uh, in charge of all that, an executive, if you will. And I had a man working with me on that truck. We were both freshmen in college at the time, and we'd gone out to the city dump to dump a load of trash, and we're on our way back. It was a Sunday morning. And we drove by a church, and here were all kinds of people with their Bibles and their little kids, and they were walking up the steps of their church, and they were all dressed out in their, their Sunday best. My friend looked over at those people and said, Look at all those pagans going in there to worship Nimrod. And I thought, Boy, you know, it hasn't been very long, not very long at all, since I was going in on those churches every Sunday morning myself. I was not only going in there Sunday morning, I was in there Sunday night, and on Wednesday night too. Was I a pagan going in there to worship Nimrod? I sure didn't think of myself that way. And those people don't either. And it was so striking to me to hear the contempt, almost spiteful contempt, pouring out of this man's mouth toward these people who were deceived and foolish and serving various lusts and pleasures. But, you know, I don't have any way of knowing for sure that some of them didn't live a better life than I did at the time. That some of them weren't really pretty good people, that they loved their children, and they went to their jobs. And some of them had the character not to steal from their employee, employers and, and so forth. But, you know, you can become very self-righteous toward people who have not been granted the mercy that you have been granted. Isn't that dumb? Because the only reason that you are not under the death penalty from God Almighty, I, don't, I mean the death penalty, I don't mean just slapping your wrists, is because of the unmerited favor and pardon of God which you never did earn. You know, mercy basically means the willingness to withhold punishment, even when the punishment is richly deserved. Now, since God has extended so much mercy to you, isn't it a good idea if you extended mercy to somebody else in the process? Because... The book says, he shall have judgment without mercy who has shown no mercy. And whenever you start speaking evil of other people and condemning other people, you are in an unmerciful spirit. And when you get into an unmerciful spirit, what does that do to your relationship with God? <laughs> I wouldn't like to think about it, would you? God says that there, there will be no mercy shown to those of us who have shown no mercy. And to whatever extent we let our mercy slip, will God's mercy slip toward us? Well, fortunately, we can get it back if we ourselves will repent, but it's a sobering thing to realize that a man can be forgiven of all of his sins and be in good graces with God, and then because he lapses into an unforgiving, unmerciful spirit toward other people, 
can fall completely out of his relationship with God. So Titus put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers. Put them in mind to speak evil of no man, to not be brawlers, but gentle, and to show all meekness to all men. Because we've got to understand that we ourselves were saved by his mercy, not because we, have, we, need, we, have, we deserved it in some way. This is a faithful saying, verse 8, And these things I will that you affirm constantly, that they who have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. <laughs> it's funny. It really is funny, but there is this attitude among Christians who believe they are saved by grace. And that includes many of us. There is a situation where you feel that, well, it's been taken care of, I'm in the church, I've been baptized, and it doesn't really make a whole lot of difference what I do from now on, as long as I sort of run generally in the right direction. hope you're right. I'm just not sure. Because we're warned here that the people who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. you got to stay after it. You've got to be on top of it. And how you live your life as a Christian makes a difference. And God cares about it. And you can't get away with a slack attitude toward him. And you know it if you allow yourself to think about it. These things are good and profitable to men. But avoid foolish questions. And boy, there will never be a shortage of those. And there will be a shortage of people who want to do genealogies thinking that there's some deep, dark truth buried down in them somewhere. He says, stay away from it. Stay away from foolish questions and genealogies. Stay away from contentions and strivings about the law. People who love to bicker and argue about the law. Don't worry about the law. The law there is to teach you personally right from wrong. You don't need to argue with anybody about it. If you want to argue about the law, if you want to discuss the law, get on your knees and talk to God about it. Tell him it's been done away with. I'm not interested in your argument. They are unprofitable, and they are vain, according to Paul. A man who is a heretic after the first and second admonition reject. I mean, the guy who is a heretic is a person basically who is, it just rejects God's truth, he turns away from it. He does indicate you work on him twice. You, you admonish him once and you admonish him again, and if you're still not making any progress, you might as well just forget it. Because you can know this about the man, that he that is such is subverted, not is being subverted or is going to be subverted, He is subverted and is sinning. My word, how could he arrive at that conclusion just because a man doesn't see the light on doctrine? Well, let me put it to you this way. Why is a man being so stubborn in his refusal to acknowledge something that is awfully clear and awfully obvious in God's Word? Why is, he, why is he wrestling with this doctrine? Why is it so important to him? Why is he fighting it? Why is he going through all this? I remember some years ago a young man who had gotten into an attitude he didn't even believe that, that wasn't even sure that God existed anymore. He was kind of a practical agnostic. This was a student in college who had been a leader in church before he even came to college. A church college, a, a college where the Bible was taught. And he decided he was agnostic, didn't know if he even believed in God or not, and two of my fellow ministers worked on him for a long time tried their best, you know, they just could not seem to crack that young man's uh, reserve on this. And finally, one of my friends, I think a little incautiously, but nevertheless, he was telling the truth. He said, he said, you know, you're sinning. You got a problem, you're sinning. And the kid said, no, I'm not sinning, I don't have any problem. And, and, and he asked him several times about it, and then the kid still rejected it, finally left college and went away. And only after he was gone did one of his friends come to us and tell us that the young man had had a problem. He'd been on a train on a trip up north in England, and he had gotten involved with a young woman on the train, and that they had had an affair, and that he was guilt-ridden over it. And the funny thing was that instead of him repenting of that problem and getting it straight in his life, he, he didn't want to own up to the fact that it was wrong. And so he had to find some other way to go. Whenever you find an unreasonable person who is a heretic, and you try every way of going about it, and you just can't make any headway with him at all. And, you know, the fact of the matter is that, that a person who is determined to disobey God and to go his own way and to do his own thing will always be able to find ways to do it. You will never be able to, to chink up all the cracks in the log wall, as it were. You will, you'll never be able to stop up all the holes. You'll never be able to, to waterproof him. Sooner or later, you know, he's going to get out. 
He says, try him twice. And if you fail twice, recognize this one thing, that he has already been subverted, that he is sinning, being condemned of himself. Self-condemnation is down there in the bottom of it all. And all the rest of this nonsense is just a way of paving over it, of covering it up, of hiding it. Do you ever hear about the red herring? You know, you understand what a red herring is? It's just simply a symbol for taking something that smells real strong and dragging it across the path of a dog who's maybe hunting or what have you, and the dog comes with a stronger smell and follows the stronger smell instead of coming on after you. You, know, you drag a red herring across the tail. We use the, the term red herring. It covers up the other, other smells, the weaker smells, by a very powerful one. And what a lot of people are doing is they're trying to cover up the smell of their own bodies and their own conduct and the stench of their own self-condemnation by another smell. They're trying to spray over it or make believe. It's like a smoker who waves his hands around and shakes his clothes and maybe sprays a little banaca in his mouth and pretend and acts like he's never been smoking, and you will never know. That's what all this striving about doctrines and genealogies and striving about the law and foolish questions and, and heretical concepts is all about. It's a red herring. I learned something about this a long time ago in an odd place. It was on a deer hunt. I was up on a deer stand, not, not really on a stand. I had just stopped in my stalking or looking and what have you uh, to have a little energy from a candy bar I had. I was sitting on a rock, and like a good hunter, I did not have a, a cartridge in the chamber. And uh, while I was unwrapping and eating my butterfinger, I saw some does begin to prance around a rock down below me. And I looked intently at them, and I got my rifle up in my hands. I was plenty of room for a shot. There was no reason to get in any hurry. And I watched, and I watched, and I watched, and no doe, no, no buck pranced out behind that rock with those does. And I sensed movement out of the corner of my eye, and instantly I knew what had happened. That the does had gone down here, and I got focused in on the does, but the buck was off to my left and just on the corner of my vision. I turned around and looked, and sure enough, there he was, and he saw me, and I saw him, and you know, it's not a very long story, but it's a bad one. I missed him. I didn't have time. I wasn't ready, because I had focused my eyes entirely in the wrong direction. I learned after that that whenever I began to see does in one place, I'd take a quick look, but then I would look all over the place elsewhere because I had begun to learn that those smart bucks send those does out to get shot at, and then they stay out of sight and somewhere else, except, of course, during the rut. The lesson is that people do use red herrings. They do try to distract, first of all, themselves, and this is what you need to understand that the person is really doing this to himself. You're just getting to sort of go along with it when you're trying to convince him of the error of his doctrine. And Paul is just telling you not to waste too much time on it. Try him once and try him again, and then just forget it, because he's already gone. He's self-condemned, and he's not going to change until somehow or other God breaks through that, that all of this smoke screen that he's putting up around himself to prevent himself from seeing what's really wrong in his life. What sort of thing could it be? Well, it could be something as simple as having given himself over to the pursuit of money and the fact that he is not he is not really keeping God's law and that he feels guilty about it, that he's maybe taken advantage of other people and that's gnawing the way at him. He's broken the Sabbath and feels uncomfortable about that. And repentance, repentance involves getting down on his knees and confessing to God and owning up to the fact that he's wrong. And he thinks it's easier to do a doctrinal study. To maybe, un, maybe the law isn't that important after all. Maybe it's just not that critical that we've been vague. Maybe God's not worried about all of that. You know, it's a long old road, and it's a hard road. And it's surprising how many people take that road instead of simply saying, Father, I'm sorry, I was wrong, I have sinned, and I'm going to try to get it straight. Paul continues, when I shall send Artemis unto you, or Tychicus, be diligent to come to me to Nicopolis, for I have determined there to winter. Bring Zenus the lawyer and Apollos on their journey diligently, that nothing be wanting unto them. And let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses, that they be not unfruitful. You know, we don't want to get to a situation where we're just not getting any results. If you're going to get results, you're going to have to maintain good works. All that are with me salute you. Greet them that love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen.